lecture for <laughs> for cultural psychology, Psych 350, uh, for the summer session. There's only 10 weeks in the summer session, uh, so we're going to get this whole thing done in, in 10 weeks. I think there's 14 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so let's talk about uh, how we pass the class. Uh, there is a chapter quiz with each chapter uh, worth 15 points apiece, uh, which adds up to 210 uh, points. Uh, there is a discussion for each chapter worth 10 points apiece. That's 140 po points. And uh, there's a five-page paper. Now, usually in a five-page paper, I'm looking for a research paper. This one is to some extent, but what I want you to do is look at a uh, culture other than uh, the Diné culture, uh, and I want you to write a paper about that culture, <clears throat> uh, comparing it with the Diné culture. Uh, I, th <laughs> I, I keep saying this, um, I think the best way to understand your own culture is to compare it with another culture. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, it can be any culture. Uh, it can be a subculture in the United States, the drug culture, uh, the gay culture, um, the cowboy culture. Uh, it can be any, any culture. Uh, it can be the French culture. It can be the, uh, I don't know, Mongolian culture. It really doesn't matter which one it is as long as it is not the dominant white culture. Dominant white culture is kind of tough because uh, it's hard to identify. It's the hardest part. What is it? What's the number? 65% of the people in the United States are, are, are white. Uh, but the reality is that if you look at all the white people in the United States, there isn't just one culture. As a matter of fact, the, the dominant culture uh, in any area is regional. It's it's fairly regional. So let's just not do that one. Uh, but you can pick any other culture. Uh, I'd like you to read a book. Yeah, it can be fiction. It can be nonfiction. It really doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it describes uh, the culture. Uh, and a lot of times fictional books uh, describe culture better because they can talk about it uh, without being without worrying about uh, somebody coming back and telling them that they did it uh, incorrectly. Okay, so that's that. Uh, what else do we need to know? Uh, I have office hours uh, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. On Monday and Tuesday, they're in the evening uh, between 3 and 5 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, it is in the morning between 8 and 10 Mountain Standard Time. And here's the address. There you go. Um, you need to write your paper in the APA format. And uh, Professor Barber uh, has uh, put this uh, PowerPoint together uh, to explain that, how that works. Is that it? That looks like enough. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, chapter one, what is cultural psychology? Let's go ahead and, and get her get her started. There we go. What is what is cultural psych what is cultural psychology? Uh, people from different cultures live their lives differently. They speak different languages. Uh, they have different customs. They eat different foods. You guys eat a lot of mutton. I grew up in Indiana. We ate, we ate a lot of pork. Um, and I moved all over the United States where some places uh, they eat a lot of beef. How do, uh, They have different religious beliefs. And this is the Hindu religion. This is the Ju Ju <laughs> Judaism. Uh, this is Buddhism. That's Christianity. And I'm not sure what that one is. <clears throat> they have different child rearing practices. Much about a person's lifestyle can be uh, predicted by uh, just by knowing his or her culture. Psychological processes are shaped by experience. 
To what extent should ways of thinking look similar around the world because people share a universal brain? To what extent should people around the world look different because they have di divergent experiences? Now, these two animals look look a lot alike, but the truth is, this is a this is a canine, this is a dog, and this is a horse. This is a, a small horse. Culture is any kind of information that is acquired from other members of one's species through social learning that is capable of affecting an individual's behavior. Any kind of idea, any kind of belief, any kind of technology, any kind of habit, any kind of practice. And of course, this is a picture of Sai, that Sai right there, with his famous Gangnam style song that uh, is... I think it's still the most popular song on, on the internet, on uh, YouTube. Haven't looked at it lately. There's Sai again, dancing with his, with his uh, uh, group. Uh, culture indicates a, a particular group of individuals. Cultures are people who are existing within some kind of shared context. Uh, yes, that's great. <laughs> Culture can be used in global in a global context. Western culture refers to people cl uh, clustered from the northern area of Europe. Uh, so when we talk about Western culture, and we talk about Western culture a lot, we need to uh, identify who we're talking about. Uh, and Western, when we're talking about the Western culture, it's a cap with a capital W. If you use a small w to, to talk about the Western culture, uh, then you're really talking about the west of the United States, uh, and that would be the western that you would be referring to. So if you use a small w, you're talking about uh, people in California, uh, Nevada, uh, Colorado, um, Arizona, New Mexico. You're talking about western people. Uh, but if you're talking about the, the entire culture that uh, includes, encompasses uh, western Europe, uh, then you you have you need to capitalize it. That way, we can tell the difference between what you're talking about uh, or what you we then we understand what your meaning is. Western culture includes the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is this this group right. Oh, this is uh, that's uh, <laughs> Northern Ireland. Yeah, so it includes everything that except uh, the gray and white in this in this picture. This is England, this is Wales, that's Scotland, and that's Northern Ireland. Uh, it includes the Netherlands, and of course this is uh, in Amsterdam, that's the canals in Amsterdam. Uh, the Dutch wear a lot of orange, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it includes France, this is uh, Paris, so obviously it's got the uh, Eiffel Tower. This is Creve Coeur, which is up on top of the hill. It's a, a large Catholic... Um, Church, Creve Coeur means uh, something of the heart. Uh, anyway, Germany. This is Neuschwanstein. That's uh, the Disney castle was was uh, built from this uh, this design. It's in Bavaria, Germany. Uh, countries with a, a strong English heritage: the United States, Australia, and Canada. <clears throat> Jewish culture, which uh, while 32% of the Jewish people in the, in the world actually live in Israel, 36% live in the United States. So there are actually more Jewish people living in the United States than there are in the whole country of Israel. Subcultures within other cultures, urban culture, uh, which is very much different from uh, rural culture. Uh, as you can see, people don't look at each other as weird as that may seem, uh, but that's part of the urban culture. The gay and lesbi lesbian culture, uh, high uh, socioeconomic status culture, people that are very are wealthy, they tend to live in gated communities, mainly because they think everybody wants to, to, uh, to rob them, so they, they have as much security as they can. Uh, the vegetarian uh, culture, uh, the vegans, he's, 
such a strong vegan that he tattooed it on his arm. Uh, the millennial culture, the people that were, were born right around uh, in the 1990s and the 2000s. I guess Britney Spears is one. I had no idea that she danced with a boa constrictor, but there you go. Toy Story, Will Smith. Uh, I'm not sure who he is, but that's uh, Batman, of course. Uh, the Harvard culture uh, is a totally different culture from uh, just about any other college campus in the United States. It's a subculture within the American culture. Mac user culture. Uh, Macs are... Uh, uh, Apple is one of the richest companies in the world, mainly because they keep coming up with new telephones and new computers and new watches and all kinds of interesting things. And people who use Macs uh, are dedicated to Macs and they don't want to do anything with PCs. And actually, I'm one of those people. I have only Mac computers. Uh, Trekkie culture, people who watch Star Trek. Of course, Star Trek was only on for two years. <laughs> <laughs> it was only on for two years. It was really popular, uh, but then it went off uh, the air. Uh, but uh, Trekkies have uh, lived long and prosper. You know, that's Mr. Spock. And then they made started making movies, and they had these huge Trekkie conventions, as weird as that is. Members of subcultures may not live near each other, but, they're, uh, but their members live in a shared context. They communicate with each other, they maintain norms that distinguish them from other groups, and they have some of the common practices and ideas. These are bronies. Bronies are My Little Pony people that are obsessed with My Little Pony. And evidently there's different colors of My Little Pony. Uh, there's unicorns. Some of them are unicorns, some of them are horses. Uh, so if, you're, um, if your My Little Pony persona is blue... There is one that's blue. I guess that would be that one. Uh, purple. There you go. He's dressed just like this My Little Pony. And he's dressed just like this My Little Pony. As cool as that is. Or not. So. <laughs> the bronies is a subculture within a culture. Each person has their own unique history of individual experiences that has shaped their views. Uh, all of these individual differences lead some people to reflexively embrace certain cultural messages, staunchly react to other cultural messages, and largely ignore some other cultural messages. Uh, military people, for example. And this guy is in Iraq, I believe. That's where they put these, uh, these things on top of their, their Humvees. Okay, so now we're going to get into a, something that is fairly obscene, but it is uh, it it ne <laughs> you need to understand this uh, because we are talking about culture, and cultures are different, and people have different ideas. So this is about as bizarre a co a, a cultural difference as we're we're going to get. The Sambia are a tribe in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is this area right here. This is Indonesia, uh, this is Irian Jaya, this is Papua, Papua New Guinea. Because of the constant warfare around them, they have culturally ingrained initiation for boys to transform into men. So if you're a member of the Sambia tribe, you need to do this in order to become a man. If you don't do this, then you're not a man, and you'll not be allowed to reproduce. No woman would have anything to do with you if, unless you did this. The Sambia believe that femaleness is an innate natural essence. Maleness must be cultivated. Boys are seen as existing in a female world and are contaminated by their mother's wombs. It is very important to rid boys of feminine habits and transform them into brave men. So how in the world are they going to do that? Initiation practices are used to transform boys into men. Uh, they pierce the septum of the nose, and we saw that back here. There we go. The septum is, is pierced. There's a bone that runs through the middle of your nose that separates your left nostril from your right nostril. They, they pierce that. 
Uh, thrashing boys with sticks is another way of doing it to make them tough. Initiation also includes older men giving jerundu to boys, uh, uh, achieved through boys performing oral sex on the man. Semen is seen as a physical basis of jerundu. Males are seen as incapable of producing semen without the initiation. In other words, they'll never be able to reproduce unless they perform oral sex on the... Uh, as boys, uh, they need to perform oral sex on the men and swallow the semen. Throughout one's life, a male engages in ingestion of semen from around ages 7 to 15, receiving fellatio to impart semen at uh, 15, heterosexual contact with wife after age 17, and some homosexual contact still. Sambian males thus go through homosexual, bisexual, and heterosexual phases throughout their lives. Sexuality seen as a core identity in Western culture is more dynamic in Sambian culture because of this initiation practice. It's the only way that you can become a male. It's the only way that you will ever be able to reproduce in that tribe. Now, curiously, there's a tribe very close to the Sambia uh, who do the same thing with uh, anal sex. They have anal sex with, uh, with boys, and they have to, to gain their strength, their, their maleness, uh, through uh, anal sex. And, of course, the, this group is oral sex. In all cultures, people speak a language between 10 and 70 phonemes. In all cultures, people smile when they are happy. In all cultures, people have a word for the color black. In all cultures, people are disgusted at the idea of incest between parents and children. In all cultures, people understand the number two. Some languages do not have a word for the color blue. People in some cultures are disgusted at the idea of incest between cousins, whereas people in other cultures are not. And I just, <laughs> I'd never seen Arrested Development before, but I, my, my wife and I watched, uh, binge-watched uh, Arrested Development, all five seasons of Arrested Development. And of course, part of uh, the storyline behind Arrested Development is that um, the... Uh, uh, there are two cousins, one's male and the other's female, and uh, the male cousin is attracted to the female cousin, uh, and he doesn't seem to be able to, to help himself. As it turns out, she is not, she is related to him. I don't know if she's his cousin. It may turn out that she's his aunt. Uh, anyway, if you've never seen the show, don't worry about it. It's really kind of strange. And, of course, the movie Kissing Cousins, where Elvis gets to play two pe different people. Well, that's one Elvis, and that's the other Elvis. And they are kissing cousins. A female student going out for a coffee might mean for the student a chance to quench her thirst, a demonstration that she has quit her diet, uh, an effort to wake herself up uh, so she can uh, study, an opportunity to pursue a romantic partner. People go out for coffee for a lot of different reasons. In some other cultural contexts, women going to coffee shops on her own is not seen as appropriate. Uh, this is the uh, Muslim culture. Uh, people in her culture do not strive for ideal body weights. Uh, it is considered sinful to seek artificial stimulants to obtain en energy. Uh, romantic relationships are typically arranged by family members. So if uh, in the United States, this is a very common thing, people going out for coffee. Uh, they're studying, they're tired, uh, they, they need some, uh, something to drink, um, and of course it may mean that they quit their diet, uh, may have something to do with the need to study, and it may have something to do with uh, uh, meeting a, a romantic partner. But in the Muslim culture, none of that. None, none of that is a part of their culture. Not a single thing. Small mammals and birds that depend on special memory for food storage have unusually large volumes in their hippocampi relative to other species. 
The longer a London cab driver has been driving a cab, the larger his posterior hippocampus becomes. In order for a London cab driver to be a cab driver, they have to memorize all the roads in London. Uh, London was uh, constructed over, over centuries, uh, over many, many centuries. So the, some of the roads will, will uh, have one name for one block, and then the next block they'll have another name. And they have to memorize all this. They have to know exactly uh, where somebody needs to go so that they won't uh, 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 charge them more than they need to charge them. That's the idea. It takes some, for some people, it takes years for them to memorize uh, the, um, uh, the map of London so that they can become a cab driver. The nature of, of, the, of the brain is not fixed from birth, but rather changes in the response to certain experiences. And because cultures provide people with particular sets of experiences on a daily basis, we can see how cultural influences could change their brain. Although people around the world are born with relatively the same brains, with time they come to have different brains by way of their different cultural experiences. Humans are so embedded in their cultural worlds that they are always behaving as cultural actors, and their thoughts are always sustained by the meanings that are derived by their cultures. There are no occasions when people step outside of their cultural meaning uh, systems and start to think instead like the universal human. Humans' thoughts are forever bound up with their own cultural meaning system. And this is one of the things that you can take to the bank as far as living on the Navajo Nation. If you've never lived anyplace else, then uh, because you live on the Navajo Nation, you're cultural structure is is Diné. There's, it can't be anything else. Um, people that uh, never move, uh, people that just live in one place all their lives, they represent that culture. Uh, and they have no way of representing any other culture, as weird as that may seem. However, somebody like me, I, I, was, uh, was, I was in the military uh, for... Uh, I was in for 12 years. My wife was in for 24 years. Uh, so we were in the military. I followed her around after I got out of the service. But um, because we moved so, mu so much and so frequently, I'm not really part of the Indiana culture anymore. I was born in Muncie, Indiana, and I lived there for 17 years. I lived there for 21, uh, 21 years until I joined the military. And then I never really actually went back to Indiana. So you couldn't say that I, I, I started out with the Hoosier culture, but I don't really have it anymore because I've lived in Oklahoma and Nebraska, uh, Montana, Iowa, uh, Oklahoma, I already said Oklahoma, Texas three times, uh, California twice, Ohio, uh, Maryland, uh, Germany, Japan, so, <clears throat> what is my culture? And that w that's a good question. That's a really good question. Many cultural psychologists have, uh, would argue that culture cannot be separated from the mind because culture and mind make each other up. If a cognitive tool does not exist in all cultures, it reflects an absence of universality and is said to be non-universal, like the skateboard would be non-universal. An existential universal exists in multiple cultures, although the phenomenon is not necessarily used to solve the same problem, nor is it equally accessible across cultures. And of course, high school sweethearts, let's get married first before we have sex. Let's get stoned first before we have sex. Let's get tested first before we have sex. And of course, this is the 1990s when uh, the AIDS epi epidemic was rampant. A functional universal exists in multiple cultures, is used to solve the same problems across cultures, yet are more accept uh, ac accessible to people from one culture than another. And of course, this hat is really kind of fascinating be because we see this hat uh, all, all around the northern tier, all around the areas that are very, very cold. 
uh, even though they came from different sources. The, this, the hat is the same. Uh, I was really surprised to see uh, 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 there is, uh, now I can't even think of his name, but let's, let's not talk about that. The Russians have this hat, the Chinese have this hat, um, they wear it in, in uh, the northern United States, they wear it in Canada, uh, and it, uh, it's not like it was stolen from one place to the other. They all came up with the same idea. I had one of these hats when I was uh, when I was a kid, except mine had a bill coming out of the, the front of it. An accessibility universal exists in all cultures, it is used to solve the same problem across cultures, and is accessible to the same degree across, across cultures. This is a bathroom from China, as interesting as that is. This is the uh, uh, shower, as you can see. The toilet. This is a bidet. This is a, a place where you wash your yourself after you use the restroom. Uh, wh however, you use the restroom. You. This is how you uh, cl you cleanse yourself in this this basin here. Uh, they do not have shower curtains in China, and the reason they don't is because they will wipe down the entire uh, bathroom after after they take a shower, and that's part of that's that's a seat for them to sit down and wash their feet and as far as they're concerned this makes sense as far as we're concerned we're thinking I don't want to squirt water all over the place and they're thinking why don't you want to clean that bathroom right uh, you know <laughs> what's wrong with you why don't you clean the bathroom after you use it the vast majority of psychological uh, studies have been uh, thus far been largely limited to explorations of the minds of people living in Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies, also known as weird societies. A recent analysis of the top six journals and six uh, subdisciplines of psychology found that 68% were American. 96% came from Western industrialized countries. 70% of all psychology uh, study participants are undergraduate students. 70%. So we, when we talk about psychology, when we talk about the research that has been done looking at psychology, who are we really talking about? What we're really talking about are undergraduate students, uh, people seeking their, their associate degree or their bachelor's degree. These aren't graduate students. These are people between, the traditional uh, uh, student is between the age of 18 and 22 years old. And 70% of all of the uh, research has been done on people between the age of 18 and 22 years old. North Americans appear to be more fascinated with psychological questions than those from much of the rest of the world. Many universities not in North America don't even offer psychology as a topic of study. The first school of psychology in Japanese universities was established in 2000. And these are examples. Department of Psychology, TCU, Harvard Faculty of Arts, Science, Department of Philosophy. So their psychology department isn't even in uh, the social sciences. It's in the philosophy department. And this is KTU, it's a uh, college in Canada, Department of Philosophy and Psychology. Some people in the diversity movement maintain a colorblind or culture-blind approach to looking at people. People are the same wherever you go. The hope is that people will interact without focusing on someone's ethnic background. This is known as post-race. So what they want everybody to be this, of the same culture. They pretend that everybody is the same. This is known as the diversity movement or the post-race movement, the culture-blind approach. Attending to and respecting group differences is frequently called the multicultural approach. The rational, rationale behind this approach is that people really do identify with their groups, and most group identities are far more meaningful than the kind that can be artificially created in the lab. 
So if you are Hispanic, then that is important to you. If you're American Indian, that's important to you. If you come from Bangladesh, that's important to you. If you come from Israel, that's important to you. If you come from um, Iran, that's important to you. And we should recognize that. This idea, maybe not a very good one. People are especially likely to, to identify with their groups if their groups are smaller than the other groups or are disadvantaged in, in some way. Minority groups tend to greatly value their group identities, and they often respond quite negatively uh, to efforts by the majority group members to ignore what makes them distinctive. This is really kind of interesting because this was going on in the United States um, when they, uh, when, uh, American Indians were taken to boarding schools, that's exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to make American Indians uh, American, uh, they were trying to make them American white people is what they were actually trying to do. They were trying to educate them to uh, assimilate uh, to the white culture, um, to the Western culture. They were trying to get rid of their, their distinctiveness. Uh, that's what they were attempting to do. And of course, people don't like people don't like that. People don't like to be told that who you were is not uh, as important as uh, uh, being like everybody else. And of course, that uh, created quite a a conflict. Efforts to downplay uh, group differences may come across as suggesting that minority members would be accepted as long as they shed their distinctive cultural identities and act like those in the majority group. And of course, this is a famous picture um, of, an, of an individual going to a boarding school. This is in 1882, and this is him th uh, three years later, looking more white than, than native. Studies done looking at corporations found that more multicultural and less colorblind the attitudes of the white employees, the more the minority employees were engaged in their work. So multiculturalism is a better idea for corporations. They get more work out of everyone if they are more multicultural, if they recognize people's cultures rather than pretending that everybody's the same. In the same study, the researchers discovered that minority employees have more trust in and comfort with a company, company that offers multicultural messages rather than one that offers colorblind messages, especially when the company has only a few minority members. So they feel better about uh, a company that treats them like they're, they're, uh, that allows them to have a cultural heritage. Ethnocentrism is judging people from other cultures by the standards of one's own culture. Our cultures ultimately socialize us to be ethnocentric because we are socialized to value normative cultural behaviors. In the 1950s, with the advance of brain imaging techniques, psychology entered the cognitive revolution as researchers rejected the tenets of Freud, Skinner, Watson, and Rogers, and began focusing on the meaning that people created through the encounters with the world. But one of the fathers of cognitive revolution, Jerome Bruner, argued that the proponents of the cognitive revolution had become distracted from its initial vision by becoming more concerned with computer metaphors for understanding the functioning of the mind. Meaning uh, became replaced with information. Meaning making became replaced with information processing. Bruner argued that cultural psychology has picked up the torch that was originally carried by early uh, proponents of the cognitive revolution and has again addressed how people derive meaning from their environments. And that is the end of chapter one. Really strange ending to that chapter. Uh, why? Because cognitive psychology is trying to take over psychology and the reality is it's not necessary. <clears throat> so let's go ahead, go ahead and, and talk about chapter two. Not a very long chapter. Okay, the last one was Chinese. This is Japanese. 
This is the background. <clears throat> culture two or chapter two, culture and human nature. Humans are quite particular about whom they choose to, to imitate. Humans are said to have prestige bias. They're especially concerned with detecting who has prestige. That is, they seek others who have skills and are respected by others, and they try to imitate what those individuals are doing. And let me give you an example. All of these people are trying to be Marilyn Monroe. Or trying to look like Marilyn Monroe. Obviously, there she is, the lady behind the legend. Okay, Marilyn. All these ladies are trying to look like Dolly Parton, I think. If I'm not mistaken. All of these guys want to be Elvis. Elvis Presley. I have a brother-in-law that talks like that. Drives me crazy. Imitating prestigious others is a very efficient way of cultural learning. Individuals are more likely to learn successfully if they target those people who are especially talented. Identifying signs of prestige and then imitating people who display those signs are skills that were likely selected for in the course of human evolution. Our ancestors who did this were more likely to acquire the highly useful cultural knowledge that gave them a survival advantage compared with those who did not. Humans have what is known as a theory of mind. A theory of mind means that people understand that others have minds that are different from their own, and thus that other people have perspectives and intentions that are different from their own. I know what you're thinking, terrible things about me. Well, screw you and your judgments. And what he was really thinking about was lemon meringue pie. Imitative learning is where the learner copies precisely what they think the model is trying to do. Emulative learning is where the learner is focused on the environmental events that are involved. The emulative learner is only focused on the events that happen around the model, not what the model intends to accomplish. In em emulative learning, you learn one task but can't use the knowledge in any other context. Human cultural learning is cumulative. Cultural information grows in complexity and often in utility over time. This is called the ratchet effect. Like a ratchet, it always moves forward and is not allowed to slip backward. Cultural information can continue to accumulate without losing the earlier information. To have cumulative cultural evolution, you need creative invention, reliable and faithful social transmission. High fidelity social transmission requires accurate imitative learning and sophisticated communication. No species but humans have shown these capabilities, and these are the brains of lots of different animals. And there's the human brain. As you can see, it's far more complex than just about any other animal except maybe the giraffe. The goat has a pretty involved brain as well. The larger the group of people, the better cultural information can be maintained and improved upon. You're more likely to encounter a successful model to copy from out of a larger group than out of a smaller group. There will be more innovations that come from a larger group than from a smaller group. So a larger group will be more likely to have at least one person stumble on a good idea because there are more people and there are more probabilities. Looking at the Polynesians settling in the South Pacific, the islands with the largest populations at the time of first contact had far more different kinds of tools than the islands with the smallest populations. Bigger populations allowed for the more rapid spread of cultural innovations. However, sometimes the ratchet does slip and a population will lose ideas. This happened with the Aboriginal population that inhabited Tasmania from the Australian mainland. And this is the Australian mainland. Strangely enough, Australia is about the size of the United States. And this is Tasmania. It's an island off the southern coast of Australia. When Europeans initially arrived in Tasmania, they found scattered foraging bands of humans utilizing the simplest technology. 
archaeological digs have shown that technology seen in their past was far more advanced than what was demonstrated in their current technology. Comparing the Tasmanian Aborigines with those across the Bass Strait in Australia, the Tasmanians maintained a toolkit of only 24 items, whereas the Australians maintained a toolkit of hundreds of items. The Tasmanians had lost bone tools, cold weather clothing, fish hooks, and boomerangs. Other groups where the ratchet seems to have slipped around the Melanesians of the I include the Melanesians of the Taurus Islands north of Australia. So the Taurus Islands, wait a minute. Let's look at Australia again. These are the Taurus Islands. The reclusive Suriano of Bolivia. The reclusive Parahi. Paraha of, uh, of Brazil. Humans are a cultural species that exists within worlds consisting of cultural information that has accumulated over history. Cultural ideas greatly influence the ways that we live our lives, determining much of what we do on a daily basis. We are all born into rich cultural worlds, and we are constantly learning and being influenced by the shared ideas that make up our culture. Sorry, I needed a drink. Our brain size is determined by the encephalization quotient, the ratio of the brain weight of an animal to that predicted but for a comparable animal of the same body size. For humans, it is 4.6, or that we have a 4 to 5 times larger brain than another mammal of our size. Only the tiny but big brain shrew has a higher ratio than humans, and they maintain a brain that accounts for 10% of their body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, and uh, it uh, represented 10 your brain represented 10% of your body weight, your brain would weigh about 20 pounds. But your brain only weighs about 3 pounds. So there you go. Our brains consume about 16% of our basal metabolism, even though our brains only represent 2% of our body weight. The brain of the average mammal only consumes 3% of their basal metabolism. The brain of the marsupial only consumes 1% of their basal metabolism. Marsupials, uh, Asia is full of marsupials. The possum, of course, the opossum is uh, the only marsupial in North America. In order to maintain the massive human brain, the trade-off was shrinkage in other areas. The chimpanzee's muscles are 27% larger than humans. Our guts, stomach and small and large intestines, are 60% smaller than that of the chimpanzee. One reason humans were able to reduce their digestive needs is because we were able to learn to do some of our digestion outside our bodies we learned to cook our food. Cooking substantially increases the amount of energy that can be extracted from food. Uh, it denatures protein. It gelatinizes starch. It makes all foods softer and easier to, di to digest, thus requiring less energy. Because of cooking, humans are able to consume food that cannot be eaten raw. This reduced the amount of chewing necessary to consume food, reducing the amount of muscle required in the human jaw. It also changed the shape of our teeth. And this is an ape. And as you can see, they have ripping and tearing teeth in the front. And as humans, we do not have that. As a matter of fact, their, all their front teeth are for ripping and tearing. And we as humans don't have that. The average human spends one hour chewing their food a day. The average chimpanzee spends six hours chewing their food. By cooking our food, we are able to evolve a much smaller digestive tract, which freed up much energy to be used for by our brains. 
primitive primates eat a lot of fruit. There are good reasons there are good reasons to eat fruit. Fruit is rich in vitamins, carbohydrates, and calories, and fruits tend to be available in concentrated patches. To live off of a diet of fruit, you need to keep in mind where the various fruit trees are located and when they would likely be bearing ripe fruit. Perhaps the greater need for a good memory and a big brain was triggered by the need to remember fruit locations. And this is an, an apple tree. It's lost all of its leaves, but the apples are still there. They look like Honeycrisp. Those primates that had better skills at remembering where the fruit was would have been more likely to eat well and have surviving offspring than those who were stumbling about aimlessly trying to find ripe pawpaws. And this is what a pawpaw looks like. The number of primate species rely on food sources that require a fair bit of ingenuity to access them. Some primates' food sources include nuts and seeds encased in hard shells, tubers that need to be dug up, termites that need to be fished out of termite mounds. Extractive food sources, such as the ones just mentioned, are often worth pursuing because they are rich in protein and energy. Those primates who were able to extract nutritious foods were more likely to survive and produce viable offspring. Most primates live complex social groups, maintaining clear power hierarchies, allowing them to form various relationships and alliances. Conflicts as well as cooperation, nepotism, and reciprocity are common. Humphrey and Dunbar have hypothesized that it was nece the necessity to navigate through the intricate and more elaborate webs of social relationships, the need to attract a mate, secure resources, and protect themselves and their offspring, that led to the development of the big brain. I would hate to have to eat dinner in that pl this place. Look how they had to dress up. Yuck. Dunbar analyzed the relationship between neocortex ratio and average group size and estimated that the average size of the human ancestral population was 147.8. Looking at subsistence societies still in existence, Dunbar discovered that the average clan size was about 148.4. In 2011, Facebook did a survey of its accounts and found that the average number of friends that people had was between 120 and 130. The same year, Twitter analyzed their accounts and discovered that people could maintain between 100 and 200 interactions. Any groups that are larger than 150 become too unwieldy to manage without some institutional structure. Yet smaller groups lose their advantages of larger numbers. Although primates are highly social uh, mammals, in many ways humans can be said to be ultra-social species. Humans tend to be far more engaged with others uh, around them than do any other primates. We are constantly attending to what others are doing. We gossip about others all the time. Our behaviors are guided a great deal uh, by what others around us are doing. We learn by imitating others. In an experiment by Dean et al. in 2012, the researchers compared the ability of a chimpanzee and, and orangutan versus a two-and-a-half-year-old to solve a physical problem and a social problem. The child and the great apes performed equally well on the physical problem at about 75%. However, for the social problem, when the subjects had to follow a model, the two-and-a-half-year-old was more likely to follow precisely what the model did. The great apes tried to solve the social problem through emulation. Most of the humans scored 100% on the social problem, while most of the apes scored 0%. So no matter how reclusive an individual or a group of humans are, culture and the biology of the human brain are bound inextricably. Humans evolved to be cultural species. And that is the end of the chapter. And that is the end of the lecture. 
So I will talk to you again next week. We'll tackle chapter three. Okay, start thinking about what culture you want to, to read about. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's not due until, I don't know, four or five weeks, six or seven weeks. Uh, sometime in July, you'll have to have your paper done. Find somebody fun. <laughs>